Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Mito Action Monthly Mito Expert Series. We are ready to go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody for joining us today. We know that these have been really, really difficult times and we hope everyone's doing well. Your families are all safe and healthy. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the Mito Action website in the coming days. If you're joining us by phone, I would encourage you to follow along with the presentation slides that could be found on the Mito Action website at www.mitoaction.org slash resources slash Dr. Wallace. If you are joining us via your computer, you should see the presentation on your screen. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen on the menu bar. If you're calling in via phone, feel free to submit your questions via email to info at mitoaction.org. After today's presentation, Stephanie Tomlinson, who is Mito Action's Mito 411 coordinator, will facilitate the Q&A. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. We're excited to have with us today Dr. Doug Wallace. Dr. Wallace is director of the Center for Mitochondrial and Ep Epigenomic Medicine at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He holds the Michael and Charles Barnett Endowed Chair in Pediatric, Mitochondrial Medicine, and Metabolic Diseases. Dr. Wallace founded the field of human mitochondrial DNA genetics and demonstrated that mtDNA variation has profound implications for human health and disease, the origins and ancient migration of our ancestors, humans and animal adaptation, and perhaps the origin of species. Dr. Wallace helped define the genes and proteins coded by mtDNA and demonstrate their essential role in mitochondrial energy production. From this foundation, he was the first to identify inherited mtDNA mutations that result in disease, initially the mtDNA missense mutation that causes Leber hereditary optic neuropathy and the protein synthesis mutation that causes myoclonic epilepsy and ragged red fiber disease. Since then, he has identified multiple pathogenic mtDNA mutations causing diseases as diverse as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Currently, his web-based mtDNA information service MitoMap now lists hundreds of clinically relevant mtDNA mutations. He also showed that the accumulation of mtDNA mutations in tissue correlates with aging and age-related diseases. Dr. Wallace was also among the first to clone nuclear DNA-coded mitochondrial genes to show their relevance to disease and to demonstrate that variants in nDNA and mtDNA genes could interact to markedly affect an individual's phenotype. He also demonstrated that regional mtDNAs, when moved to new environments, can predispose to a wide range of complex diseases. Dr. Wallace was the first to develop mouse models of mitochondrial disease and to invent a procedure for introducing mtDNA mutations into the mice female germline. He has provided compelling evidence that mtDNA variation is central to health and the common diseases. Dr. Wallace has received countless awards and recognitions for his seminal contributions to human and mammalian genetics, and he has published countless papers on his research and findings. In May of 2019, he received the Franklin Institute's prestigious Benjamin Franklin Medal for the Life Sciences. On June 20th, 2017, it was announced that the 2017 Paul Jensen Award for Biomedical Research would be awarded to Dr. Doug Wallace for pioneering the fields of mitochondrial genetics and its application to the study of disease, aging, and patterns of human migrations. We are honored to have Dr. Wallace with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Doug Wallace. Well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction and for giving me the opportunity to join you all <clears throat> on uh, this Friday um, at noon, at least on the East Coast of the US. So our group has been interested uh, for many years now, um, uh, almost 40 years, on the role of mitochondrial variation in human health and disease. 
And uh, this uh, has led us to ask a very simple question, which is why don't we understand and why can't we solve the common complex diseases? And these are the neuropsychiatric disorders uh, in children, Lee syndrome or autism in adults, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, migraine, depression, or heart and muscle diseases such as cardiomyopathy, cardiovascular disease, myal myalgia, uh, or chronic fatigue syndrome. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> visceral diseases such as renal, hepatic, and gastrointestinal problems, metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, uh, inflammatory diseases like type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lupus, um, and multiple forms of cancer and even aging. So um, with all the investment and effort that people have put into understanding these common problems, uh, we've made surprisingly little progress in um, not only understanding them, but on um, developing ways to uh, eliminate their uh, devastating effects. So um, a philosopher, um, Thomas Kuhn, a number of years ago wrote a book saying, when um, science uh, invests more and more resources in trying to solve a problem, and the a number of uh, successful results declines, um, then the problem is not the effort that's put in or the uh, financial investment, but often is the basic premises on which the problems are being addressed. And in um, Western medicine, uh, we consider or look at inherited diseases from two fundamental paradigms that go back as much as 500 years ago. The first is that a disease um, is classified by the organ in which um, it has the primary effect. So that leads to the corollary that if I have, have a headache, then I should go see the neurologist because that person would be able to tell me why I get a headache and to cure it. That's uh, what I call the anatomical paradigm of disease. And the other concept is that um, diseases that are inherited are inherited according to the laws of Gregor Mendel, who lived about 150 years ago. And he was the first to um, study pea plant inheritance and found that some of the uh, genes, now called genes, and, uh, followed an inheritance pattern as uh, assuming that each uh, adult individual had two copies of the gene, one copy going into each gamete, and then on fertilization, the two copies came again to make the new individual. Um, this Mendelian pattern of inheritance was very powerful in explaining the anatomical inheritance of um, mutations in things like fruit flies at the beginning of the 20th century. And it was so compelling that that came to be uh, what I call the Mendelian paradigm of genetics. And that corollary is if things are inherited according to Mendel, they're genetic, and if they're not, they're environmental. But these two paradigms, which have been the stalwart of um, medical genetics for many, many years, have failed to really give us much insight into these common diseases that we talked about above. So then that raises the question, well, if those paradigms are inadequate, what is basically uh, their limitation? And uh, it's obvious that to be alive is not just to have an anatomy because the person who has died still has his or her anatomy, but they are not clearly alive. So what's the difference between your anatomy and being alive? And the difference is your energy. So Newton showed um, 500 years ago that mass is, is inanimate unless it's acted on by energy. And since people are the most animated things in our environment, then energy must be critically important to being alive and being human. So that then leads to the realization that life is not just about anatomy and the information for anatomy, which is in the nucleus, but also about energy and the information for energy. And the, what I'm going to make a point of today is that the key information for energy is not in the nucleus where it would be inherited according to the laws of Mendel, but is in fact outside the nucleus in the mitochondria in the mitochondrial DNA. So we now feel that we can have more success in understanding the common um, metabolic and degenerative diseases if we think energetically rather than anatomically. After all, um, uh, when a person has a um, clinically relevant mitochondrial disease, it isn't their anatomy that is affected. It's their um, vi vitality to walking upstairs, to doing lots of things that they want to do. So where, what are we talking about when we talk about um, these um, mitochondria? 
Well, the uh, human cell, of course, uh, has a nucleus where the genes for uh, Mendel, uh, the uh, chromosomal genes are located, on, inherited according to Mendel's laws. But outside are hundreds of these small uh, bacteria um, that live inside our cells called the mitochondria. And these bacteria um, entered um, uh, the cells that ultimately gave rise to us about two billion years ago. And they brought with them their own DNA, uh, which is then transcribed into RNA, and the RNA is translated into proteins. That is, they had their own independent information and storage retrieval system in parallel to the nucleus, which has, of course, DNA transcribed into RNA and translated into protein. But the difference is that in the nucleus, there are only two copies of each gene, but in the mitochondria, since there are hundreds of mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNAs are in the mitochondria, then each cell has hundreds to even thousands of mitochondrial DNAs. So instead of having a two um, allele or two um, gene system as in the nucleus, we now have a thousand uh, gene system in the mitochondria, and that's a fundamental difference. So initially, uh, both the um, host organism that gave rise to the nucleus and the cytosol and the mitochondria <clears throat> were co-equal and free-living organisms. But over time, many of the genes for the mitochondrial DNA were transferred into the nucleus to then allow the mitochondria to specialize in making energy and not spending its energy in making more of itself. So as a result now, uh, we have a specialization with the nuclear cytosol specializing in anatomy and structure and the mitochondria specializing in energy, the vital force. And so for the uh, Drosophila geneticists that were interested in the developmental biology of the fruit fly, obviously all of the genes that they studied were in fact chromosomal and therefore Mendelian. But the fruit fly studies never looked at the activity of the fruit flies, not until recently. And so this other quantitative genetics, they were blinded to. So where does the energy come from that we use in our body? Well, originally it comes from the sun. And the sun uh, then, uh, photons from the sun impinge on another symbiotic bacteria that live in plants called chloroplasts. These are also bacteria, just like our mitochondria bacteria. And the chloroplasts then take the photon and use the energy of the photon to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And so, of course, plants make the oxygen that we breathe, but more importantly, they put the hydrogen on carbon that they get from the atmosphere and CO2, and they make sugar, glucose. And so, in fact, we then, then take the energy that's stored up in glucose in plants, which can be, of course, carried through animals, um, but ultimately, we're burning the um, reduced sugars uh, with the oxygen that we're breathing to regenerate uh, water and CO2. And in the meantime, we generate a high energy molecule, ATP, for doing work, and we generate heat to maintain our body temperature. So in fact, um, we are clued to the energy flow from the sunlight through plants uh, via glucose. So how does uh, this um, then result in our energy production system. So this is uh, your cellular power plant, the mitochondria. This is one power plant, one mitochondria, and it's surrounded by two membranes, an outer more continuous membrane and an inner hydro highly folded inner membrane. And uh, in between the two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane is what we call the intermembrane space shown here in tan. And then <clears throat> inside the inner membrane, um, is the uh, matrix, and that's the cytoplasm of the original bacteria. <clears throat> so when we eat sugar, that is glucose, uh, we process the sugar by a system called glyco uh, glycolysis, and it splits the six-carbon sugar into two three-carbon acids called pyruvate. Now, there's a, a carrier of hydrogen called NAD, which can be reduced, giving NADH or oxidized NAD, and we can use the NADH and pyruvate to reduce it to give you lactate by an enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. Or the pyruvate can get an amino group from say an amino uh, acid, and that can give you then an amino acid called alanine. And people that have very, very severe mitochondrial defects um, can have in fact increased uh, lactate and alanine in their blood and their urine. But normally the pyruvate goes through a pyruvate carrier to pyruvate dehydrogenase, and there it's split 
and uh, processed through something called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And the first step of this is to make acetyl-CoA, and then it proceeds around the system. The purpose of this tricarboxylic acid cycle is to remove the hydrogens from the hydrocarbon and put them on the carrier NAD to give you the reduced form NADH. Now we're going to burn the hydrogen from NADH by what's known as the electron transport chain, which is NADH dehydrogenase or complex one, the electrons going to coenzyme Q in the intermembrane, and then coenzyme Q taking the electrons to complex three, and complex three adding the electron to cytochrome C, and cytochrome C carrying the electron to cytochrome C oxidase or complex four, and then um, two electrons uh, from complex four reduce an atom of oxygen to give you a molecule of water. So this is then burning the reduced hydrogen to make water by the oxidized uh, oxygen. Now the energy that's released as the electrons move through complex one, three, and four down this redox gradient are used to pump positive ions from the mitochondrial matrix through the lipid bilayer of the inner membrane uh, into the intermembrane space to create a capacitor that's positive and acid on the outside and alkaline and negative on the inside. So sitting in your chair right now or standing, whatever you're doing, um, uh, are 100 trillion cells. And within each of those cells is about 1,000 bacteria. And each of those bacteria have a capacitor of about 0.2 volts, of about yeah, point, uh, 0.2 volts. Therefore, the total uh, energy capacity standing inside your body right now, the potential energy, is the equivalent of a lightning bolt. And that's the energy that makes the difference between you being alive and dead. Because when you stop breathing, then you stop pumping protons out, the membrane potential collapses, there's no longer potential energy, and without potential energy to drive uh, your biology, uh, you in fact become inert. So in fact, we can then use this potential energy for lots of reasons. One way we could use them is to make this carrier, uh, chemical carrier called ATP. And so the high energy uh, protons flow through the ATP synthase or complex five, and the energy that's used is con used to condense ADP and phosphate to make ATP. And then the ATP is exchanged across the inner membrane by a series of proteins called the adenine nucleotide translocators. And the ATP then goes out through a sieve like protein in the outer membrane, voltage dependent anions channel or porin. And there the ATP can be used to do work, like move your muscles or. Um, uh, transport ions across your neurons, um, or basically anything that you want to do. So we use this chemical carrier to uh, carry the energy of the electrochemical gradient out to do work. So you're coupling oxidation with phosphorylation, and we call that oxidative phosphorylation. Now it turns out that different people are, have different efficiencies of pumping protons out as the electrons flow down the electron transport chain and of converting them into ATP. So people that are very efficient at taking the calories from glucose into hydrogen, burning them to make a membrane potential and converting them to ATP, those that are very efficient at that, we call them tightly coupled. They've tightly coupled between electron transport and ATP synthase. So they're going to get the maximum amount of work for the minimum amount of calories burned. Now, a calorie is a unit of heat, so they're going to then generate the minimum amount of heat for the maximum amount of work. On the other hand, if a person is less efficient at pumping protons out and converting them into ATP, then they're going to have to burn more calories for the same amount of ATP. But since they're burning more calories, they're generating more heat. So they're going to, in fact, have a higher heat load relative to work level than the tightly coupled individuals. And as you'll see, that coupling efficiency um, is a very important factor in differentiating people around the world. Also, uh, because this is a furnace, it has smoke, and the smoke are called oxygen radicals, or reactive oxygen species. And that's because uh, smoke is due to incomplete uh, combustion. So here we get a single electron that goes directly onto O2, and that gives an unpaired electron. And that unpaired electron in superoxid anion wants another electron, and it will pull the electrons from lipids or proteins or DNA, and that will damage the cell. And that's why oxygen radicals are bad. We have an enzyme, manganese SOD, that takes two of these and makes um, uh, hydrogen peroxide. That's more stable, but it's still toxic because if 
it encounters a reduced transition metal, it will give hydroxyl radical, which is an even more potent oxidizing agent than superoxide anion. So we have another enzyme, glutathione peroxidase, that takes hydrogen peroxide to water to try and neutralize this negative effect. Unfortunately, this is a rate limiting step. So we still always have residual hydrogen peroxide in our mitochondria, and that is uh, often causing damage to the mitochondria. Now the um, membrane potential, which is acid and, um, I mean, alkaline and negative on the inside and acid and positive on the outside, that can also be used for lots of other reasons. One thing it can be used to do is to regulate cytosolic calcium. Calcium is positive charge, so it'll go into the negatively charged matrix through a specific carrier called the uh, uh, calcium uniporter. And calcium is a key um, inorganic molecule that is used to regulate large numbers of different reactions inside your cells. So the mitochondria indirectly can regulate a lot of metabolism by regulating the calcium level. And the mitochondria also have a self-destruct system uh, called the mitochondrial permeability transition pore. The actual structure of this is still actively debated, but we know that the adenine nucleotide translocator plays a role in its regulation. Anyway, normally this is a closed um, door that allows the membrane potential to be maintained. But if the mitochondria gets sick, that is the membrane potential declines, the amount of ATP produced gets low, the oxidative damage gets high, or there's a ma major flux of calcium into the mitochondria, they all impinge on this permeability transition pore. And suddenly, uh, when things get bad enough, it goes from a closed door to an open door. And when it does that, it short circuits the membrane potential and fluids flow into the matrix. The inner membrane swells. And then two proteins form a gap in the outer membrane called backs and back. And they release all these stored proteins that then go out and cause the cell to be degraded from inside out. And the reason for that is because these are perfectly good bacteria and they have all the same antigens that bacteria that invade your body. So if your cells just popped open and released a thousand bacteria in your bloodstream, you would then get a very big immune response. So by having this intracellular degradation called apoptosis, you can in fact remove the sick mitochondria before they cause an antigenic response in your cells, in your body. So then the mitochondria generates most of the energy, it regulates oxidation reduction balance, it generates the reactive oxygen species, it regulates calcium, and it regulates apoptosis, uh, cell death. So the mitochondria then turns out to be very central to most aspects of cellular metabolism. So basically then the mitochondria is a living organism inside your cells, uh, just like the nucleus has uh, DNA in the chromosomes that transcribed into messenger RNAs and to structural RNAs like transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs, and those uh, messenger RNAs are translated on cytosolic ribosomes. Um, about 2,000 nuclear encoded genes are now used to assemble the mitochondria. So they're made in the cytoplasm and imported into the mitochondria. But the mitochondria has retained its own DNA. It's circular, 16,569 base pairs, codes for transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and 13 polypeptide messenger RNAs. And these messenger RNAs then are translated on mitochondrial ribosomes that are sensitive to bacterial inhibitors, such as chloramphenicol or aminoglycosides. And their the protein synthesis is initiated by a formal group, just like bacterial, uh, bacterial proteins are, and therefore are highly antigenic to our system. So these polypeptides then, 13 polypeptides, are critical components of making complex one, three, four, and five. There's seven of the 45 proteins of complex one come from the mitochondrial DNA, one of the 11 proteins from complex three, three of the 13 proteins from complex four, and uh, two of the 17 proteins of complex five. So if 2,000 of the original bacterial genes are now in the nucleus, why did the mitochondria keep these 13 polypeptides? And the answer of that comes when we go back to look at the structure. So complex one, three, and four all pump protons into the matrix. And complex five uses that proton gradient. So they all share the same proton gradient. So therefore, if any one of these had a become, became more or less coupled than the others, let's say this became more leaky for protons, it would short the capacitor and that would kill the patient.
So these have to co-evolve so that they're always balanced with each other. And the only way that that can be done is if all of those key genes that are involved in electron proton pumping are co-evolved on the same piece of DNA and that that DNA is not allowed to recombine. So they then can only change by sequential mutations with each mutation being tested against its efficiency for all the other, proton, all the other proteins that are involved in this energy generating process. So the mitochondrial DNA then um, is a circular molecule of 16,569 base pairs, and it's inherited exclusively from the mother. The mother transmits her mitochondria to, uh, and her mitochondrial DNA to her children. Her daughters transmit it to their children, but the male's mitochondria enter the egg, are seen as foreign, and are selectively destroyed. So only the mitochondrial DNA from the mother are ever transmitted to the children. That means that the mitochondrial DNAs can never match, that is a male and female mitochondria never get together in the same cytoplasm and therefore never recombine. And so the only way that this mitochondrial DNA can change is by progressive sequential mutations along continuous maternal lines. And that then allows every new mutation to be tested against all the other genes on this same wiring diagram for the power plant. Now each cell has hundreds to thousands of mitochondrial DNAs, and they're constantly replicating inside your cells. So they accumulate mutations by replication errors. And so I've shown mutant here in red and normal in blue. Now, if this the cell was, say, an egg, and it divided this way, then both daughter cells would get some mutant and some normal. But if the egg divided this way, then this cell would have only good mitochondrial DNAs, and this would have bad, some more bad mitochondrial DNAs. So because of this uh, random processing by cell division, the mitochondrial genotype in the cytoplasm can drift during development to give rise to some tissues with primarily good mitochondrial DNAs and other tissues in the same individual with more mutant mitochondrial DNAs. And as the number of mutant mitochondrial DNAs increases, the number of wiring diagrams for the power plants are, are decreasing, and that takes the power plants offline so ultimately, there's a di diminishing amount of energy production. And when the amount of energy production drops below the minimum for that organ to function normally, that which we call the bioenergetic threshold, then we begin to see clinical symptoms. So this is the equivalent of what happens in a metropolitan brownout. As more and more power plants go offline, the line voltage begins to decline. And um, first, the um, fluorescent lights that have to have an exact uh, um, voltage go out and then other systems begin to fail depending on their requirement for that particular voltage differential until ultimately the incandescent light bulbs get dimmer and dimmer, dimmer until they ultimately go out too. And that's exactly what happens with mitochondrial disease. It's a quantitative uh, decline in energetics and giving you then a quantitative decline in function. Now the mitochondrial DNA codes for these 13 proteins plus a small and a large ribosomal RNA and 22 transfer RNAs that punctuate the mitochondrial genes. So um, the 12S and the 16S ribosomal RNA genes, uh, the 22 transfer RNA genes, and then uh, uh, seven complex one genes, ND1, ND2, ND3, 4L, 4, 5, and 6. Um, cytochrome B for complex one, three, I mean, cytochrome oxidase genes CO1 and two and three for complex four, and ATPA six and eight for complex five. So there are three different classes of um, clinically relevant mitochondrial DNA changes. One are mutations that occur in the female germline, uh, and they initially occur like one mitochondrial DNA being mutant and all the rest normal, but over time in that heteroplasmic state, the percentage of mutant mitochondrial DNAs can increase until in fact it gets high enough to begin to cross its expression thresholds and give the phenotype. So there are both protein synthesis mitochondrial mutations and polypeptide mitochondrial DNA mutations. So um, poly uh, protein synthesis mutation, this mutation in the 12S ribosomal RNA at mitochondrial nucleotide position 1555, if you inherit that from your mother and you take an aminoglycoside like streptomycin, then you will rapidly go deaf. Uh, and that then just increases your sensitivity to that bacterial ribosomal inhibitor. 
or if you have a mutation in the tRNA leucine gene uh, at 3243, and you have about 20% mutant mitochondrial DNA heteroplasmy, you'll have type 2 diabetes. If you have 50%, you'll have neurological and muscle disease. And if you have 100% mutant, you'll die in, as an infant with Lee syndrome. Um, or you can have a mutation in the tRNA lysine gene at 8344, and uh, that gives you this kind of epilepsy, myoclonic epilepsy and ragged red fiber disease. There are now hundreds of ribosomal or tRNA, tRNA mutations that are available in our MitoMap database. But there are also missense mutations, like this mis missense mutation changes an amino acid in ND4, a nucleotide position 11778, and this mutation, if you inherit that from your mother, you'll be fine until midlife, and suddenly you'll lose central vision in one eye and then in the other and be blind, and that's called labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. A mutation at 14484 in the ND16 will give you that same phenotype. Mutation in the ND16 at 14459, however, it was a more severe mutation. If you're heteroplasmic, it will give you the optic atrophy, but if you're pure mutant, way over here, it gives you generalized dystonia. And a mutation in the ATPA16 at 8993, um, if it's heteroplasmic at 70%, it will give you um, uh, retinitis pigmentosa. If it's about 85% mutant, it will damage your brainstem and your cerebellum. And if it's at 95% mutant, it will kill you as an infant with Lee syndrome. So these are maternally inherited mitochondrial DNA mutations that can either be homoplasmic or heteroplasmic. Then there are also ancient polymorphisms, like this variant in the ND1. It defines a mitochondrial lineage that's found in three quarters of all sub-Saharan Africans. Or this variant uh, in CO1 defines a mitochondrial lineage that we call H, and that's half of all Europeans. Or variants A, B, C, and D, they arose in Central Asia, and those lineages crossed the Bering Land Bridge and colonized the Americas. So these variants define mitochondrial lineages, which we call haplogroups, that are critical uh, in adapting our energy metabolism to different environments. And then finally, we accumulate these somatic mutations, as I mentioned here, by replication errors over time as we age. And that gives you an age-related decline in function. That is why we believe many of the common diseases you don't have the problem young and early in life because you have a partial inherited defect, but then the somatic mutations add to that further diminishing energy until you cross the expression threshold and then you get the clinical disease. Now the question is then, why do patients with mitochondrial disease have only some organs affected? And it turns out the answer for that is that there is an anatomy for energy. Um, so the brain is only 2% of your body weight, but uses 20% of all your mitochondrial energy. And so therefore, a small decrement in uh, mitochondrial energy will give you neurological diseases. And that's why neurological diseases are very common in patients with mitochondrial DNA mutations. But also the heart, the muscle, renal, and endocrine systems are all very high energy systems. So our brain then, and our heart, muscle, and renal systems are high energy using systems but we also have to store energy. Now we don't store energy that much in sugar, we store it in fat. So we store fat in white adipose tissue, adipose uh, way of saying fat, in white fat tissue, and that uh, uh, fat is stored to, uh, to use in, as a source of energy when uh, you're in a fasting state. We also store fat in brown adipose tissue, and this fat is burned to generate heat to regulate thermal regulation. So again, we have this dichotomy between ATP and thermal regulation. We also have an energy homeostasis tissue, the liver, and it, it regulates blood glucose. Well, why is that? Because that's our connection with sunlight. So then our energy metabolism is based on the ratio of sugars that is available in our diet through carbohydrates or fats available through things like meat. So when we're fasting, then we have um, very little sugar and that sugar is limiting and it's uh, the pancreatic uh, alpha cells then make a hormone called glucagon and that glucagon goes to all your tissues and mobilizes the white adipose tissue to put the fat out so your mitochondria can then burn the fat to get you past the period when you had limiting glucose. 
But if you have a high glucose diet, then your uh, pancre pancreatic beta cells send out insulin and insulin goes and says, turn down fatty acid oxidation because we have lots of sugar right now. And we can use that for metabolism. <clears throat> so the point I'm trying to make here is that we shouldn't look at anatomy as structure. Anatomy is actually based on energy. And the reason that our organs are um, designed the way they are is to maximize the utilization, the storage, and the monitoring of energy. So once you decide that energy is more important and central to medicine than anatomy, then suddenly all the common diseases have exactly the same pathophysiological mechanism, and that is the efficiency by which the mitochondria make energy. This can be affected by mutations in nuclear genes, um, which affect the mitochondrial function, or changes in their expression through the epigenome. It can be affected by uh, recent deleterious mutations in the maternal lineage, or ancient adaptive polymorphisms that occurred as our ancestors moved out of Africa and around the world. But it can also be affected by your environment, the kinds of calories you have, uh, and how you use those calories, whether you exercise, <coughs> um, or whether you need them for growth, or whether you take on toxins, such as uh, if you're a smoker. All of those things will modulate your mitochondrial function. If you impair mitochondrial function, then in fact the reduced energy also causes increased oxidative stress, and that damages your mitochondria DNA, and over time you get a progressive decline, and that age-related decline in energetics is why we have aging and why there's delayed onset and progressive course of disease. If you have a partial defect in energetics, then it's gonna first affect the brain, then the heart, the muscle, and the renal system. And those are the organs that are all affected with the common diseases. But also if you impair the furnace and you have a high level of fuel, that is glucose and fats, then in fact, they're gonna build up because they're not being burned. And that's what diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome is. And then finally, if your mitochondria are damaged so that the cell cannot undergo apoptosis, then it releases all those bacteria into the bloodstream, the mitochondria, and that initiates the inflammatory response. And that, we believe, is why all these common diseases also have an inflammatory component. And then finally, cancer is all about having enough energy to grow. So with that background, then, I'm going to give you some examples. So this is a um, classic um, now mitochondrial disease. Uh, where uh, we have a mutation in the, nu uh, in the mitochondrial DNA tRNA leucine gene at nucleotide position 3243, A to G transition. Now, this uh, mutation in this particular pedigree, which we worked up in the early 1980s, this woman had lactic acidosis and short stature. She had 11 children, of which these we could actually examine. They all had lactic acidosis, growth retardation, progressive dementia, stroke-like episodes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and cardi cardiac conduction defects. Um, this would now be called the Milos syndrome, but at the time that term didn't exist. Now, uh, this family had about 70% uh, of their mitochondrial DNAs with this mutation, and so it was high enough to be maternally inherited and to give this effect. And all the muscle of these individuals, the oxidative muscle fibers degenerated, called ragged red fibers, whereas the glycolytic fibers uh, were intact, and we saw these pericristin arrays of the damage to mitochondria. Now what's amazing about this particular mutation, it is now known that at 10 to 30% mutant, it's associated with either autism or type one or type two diabetes. At 70 to 80%, it gives you the, myo myoclonic, uh, the mitochondrial myopathy, cardiomyopathy and Milos syndrome. But at a high level of mutant, it gives you a lethal childhood disease called Lee syndrome. So why is it that exactly the same mutation gives these three distinct different uh, clinical presentations. So what we did is we used something we, uh, met, method we developed in the early 70s called the cyber transfer. We made a cell without its own mitochondria, but it has a uniform nucleus, and then we could put the patient mitochondria into the cytoplasm, and we can create cells with different percentages of the mutant mitochondrial DNAs. <clears throat> so now we're looking at progressive decline in energy. Then we took each of these cells and we uh, isolated the RNAs and sequenced the RNAs to look at which genes were, were transcribed. And then we uh, deduced all the transcription factors that would account for those gene expression profiles. 
So you can see in the 20 to 30% region for diabetes, all of those cells have this profile. In the 50 to 90% region for neuro neuromuscular disease, then all the cells have this profile. Whereas in the 100% mutant with the lethal disease, they have yet a third profile. And then a cell without mitochondrial DNA has even a different profile. Or if we look at all the mitochondrial, all of the cellular transcripts together, this is the pattern for normal. This is the pattern for diabetes and autism. This is the pattern for neurodegenerative disease. This is the pattern for lethal childhood disease. And this is the pattern with a cell with no mitochondrial DNA at all. So the clinical phenotypes are due to the mitochondria causing distinct changes in the gene expression of the nucleus, and those nuclear changes then define the clinical presentation. <clears throat> okay, so here is a, um, a classic mitochondrial uh, disease mutation in the mitochondrial ATP synthase 6 gene at nucleotide position 8993, a T to G transition that changes a leucine at codon 156, that's the amino acid number, to arginine. And this family came to my clinic uh, in the um, ooh, late 80s. Um, and uh, this woman was carrying this little boy, and this boy was toddling along behind. And as he walked down the hall, he kept bumping into the, the wall, opposite walls of the corridor. Um, so immediately we knew he had cerebellar ataxia, that is the ability of his cerebellum to coordinate walking. And this little boy had had a mild fever and now had become unresponsive. And her mother was panicked because from a different marriage, she had had another little boy that went through the same uh, phenomena and he had died of what we now call Lee syndrome. Now uh, we then uh, analyzed the eyes of this, the mother, her mother, and her two half sisters, and they all had this kind of uh, eye where they had these changes in the retina, retinitis pigmentosa. But we also found this gentleman in nursing home, and uh, he had a cerebellum that was reduced to one third the size of its normal size, should fill this whole cavity, and a, a brain stem that was half the normal size because it should fill this whole cavity. So he was, in fact, basically uh, inert. So basically then what we had is um, a variable phenotype all along the maternal lineage. And then we discovered that it had this particular mutation, but these little boys had mutation in 90 to 100% heteroplasmy. These women were 75% mutant, and this gentleman was 80 to 90% mutant. So in just a very small percentage difference between 75 and 90%, we had this entire array of different clinical presentations, giving a maternally inherited disease, but with totally different clinical phenotypes. So we were very interested in knowing what the biochemistry of that was. So we used this uh, cyber technique that I developed many years ago, where we take a cell, um, that we're going to use as the recipient, so it has a nucleus we can select for, and we cure it of its resident mitochondria with a drug. Then we take the patient's cell and we remove his or her nucleus by putting the cell in cytoclasin uh, B, which disaggregates the skeleton of the cell, and putting it in a density gradient so that we can then isolate, uh, pull the nucleus out of the cell and isolate the cytoplasmic fragment. Take the cytoplasmic fragment and then we can fuse this to the cell without its own mitochondria and now have this nucleus with this patient's mitochondria. So now we can analyze the mitochondrial function in the absence of any change of the original patient's nucleus. So this is uh, what this would look like if we put those cells in a closed chamber with a fixed amount of oxygen, the cells will use the substrates available, in this case sugar, and use up the oxygen. So we put in the mitochondria, and then we put in a substrate, pyruvate and malate, and the uh, cell starts using the oxygen. Then we put in ATP, which is gonna phosphorylate, so it's gonna use that membrane potential, and it's gonna cause the mem uh, electron transport chain to speed up. So the oxygen consumption increases until all the ATP is phosphorylated, then it goes back into the more resting state. We add more ATP, it goes faster again, goes, uses up all the ATP, ADP goes back to the resting state, or we can just punch a hole in the inner membrane, and now we get max, maxim, maximum uncoupled respiration. So that's what the normal looked like. But in the patient, we put in the mitochondria, we get a slower initial rate, we add ATP, it's much slower than here, 
Uh, it, we ultimately phosphorylate all the ATP, but add more ADP, it's slow, um, phosphorylated. Then we add the uncoupler and it goes back to the fast rate. So what does that mean? That means something is wrong with the ATP synthase because it's in, 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 inhibited relative to the control. <clears throat> so this is actually what happened. This is the leucine that is normally present in this particular protein encoded in the mitochondria. And this leucine is adjacent to another protein um, from the nucleus that has a negatively charged glutamate. And the, high, the proton goes to the glutamate in through the membrane and out into the matrix. And this leucine then allows this glutamate to slide past the leucine. But when the mutation occurs, it changes the leucine, which is neutral, to a positively charged arginine. And the positively charged arginine binds to the negatively charged glutamate and blocks the channel. And now the mitochondrial ATP synthase stops functioning. And then this spinning wheel then becomes stalled, the uh, axle is blocked, and the ATP synthesis st stops. And when you have most of your mitochondrial DNAs mutant like that, you don't make the ATP, and then you get these disease symptoms. <clears throat> now, this is another disease mutation. This is a missense mutation in a complex one gene. The gene is the ND6 gene. This uh, pedigree was originally published by Massimo Zeviani, um, but here is the person who has the mutation. It changes the amino acid number 25 from proline to leucine, and that proline is very highly conserved across many species. So if you then look at this patient, she had 50% of the mitochondrial DNAs in her blood mutant, and she had optic atrophy and cerebellar ataxia. Her sister had 5% mutant. She had three different consorts. All of her children were 100% mutant, and they all died of Lee syndrome. So that shows how rapidly you can segregate along the maternal lineage, a heteroplasmic mutation. So we wanted to see if that, in fact, was the cause of disease. We made a, a mouse model of this. So what we do is we take mouse cell lines, we mutagenize them, and then we screen the mitochondrial DNAs for those that have mutations that are clinically relevant. So here's the mutation in the mouse, the same proline 25 to leucine, another cytochrome oxidase mutation, valine 421 to alanine, or here we've just mixed two normal mitochondrial DNAs. So we take the um, cell, we remove its nucleus again, we fuse the cytoplasmic fragment, but this time we fuse it to a pluripotent embryonic stem cell that has the ability to make all the tissues of the body. We then remove uh, the mitochondria from the stem cell with a drug and then substitute them for the mutant mitochondria. We put those into then the cybrid, we put it into a uh, blastocyst of a mouse, put it to a foster mother, we get then a mixture of uh, cells in development from the blastocyst and from the embryonic stem cell, and if we breed these females and we pick up then the agouti nucleus, we've also picked up the mitochondrial DNA. So when we do that, we can get the cytochrome oxidase mutation that has a 50% reduction in that enzyme, complex four. It gets cardiomyopathy with abnormal mitochondria, and as it ages, it gets type two diabetes with insulin resistance and glucose intolerance. If we look at the ND6 mutation, proline 25 to leucine, it has a 50% reduction in complex one. Uh, it has increased mitochondrial ROS production, and that gives you neurological disease. So this is an ATP disease. This is an oxidative stress disease. Now we can just mix the two mitochondrial DNAs, one from a normal mouse with an NZB mitochondrial DNA and another from a normal mouse with 129 mitochondrial DNAs. Now these mitochondrial DNAs differ in about 91 nucleotides. And that's about the difference between a sub-Saharan sub African and a, uh, an Eskimo. So now we've um, violated maternal inheritance. Um, we've now mixed two distant mitochondrial DNAs together. So now we have the heteroplasmic animal, and this is one mitochondrial DNA, and this is the other. If we then uh, cross this in animal with this male, then all the offspring carry the heteroplasmy and the daughters of that carry the heteroplasmy. But if we look at the males, they do not transmit the heteroplasmy. Their um, uh, female uh, compatriot transmits her mitochondrial DNA, and the same on this side. So now we have maternal inheritance of a heteroplasmy. The question is, if you defeat maternal and uniparental inheritance, what do you get? 
So here's the mouse with its two different mitochondrial DNAs. And they all have the same nucleus, so we cause one mouse to lose one mitochondrial DNA and keep only the 129. And the other mouse to lose only the NZB, uh, only the 129 and keep the NZB. And we have one mouse with both. So we can then take these mice and we ask, do they have different characteristics? So mice are active at night, and these are different uh, mice over time. And you can see the mice were active at night and then sleep at day and at night for the 129 and also for the NZB, at night active, sleep at day active at night. But the heteroplasmic mice, they're, they're depressed. They don't, uh, they're hardly active at all. So then we asked, well, do they learn differently? So this is known as a Barnes maze, where uh, we have a platform up the air, and only under this particular hole is a little black box. All the rest of these holes drop precipitously to the floor. We put the mouse in the middle, with a bright light and it has colored patterns around here so the mouse can orient it itself. And it looks through all the holes to try and find an escape, to, a place to escape from the platform. And ultimately it finds the hole and jumps in. So we can do this on day one, two, three, and four. And over time, the uh, NZB mouse learns where the hole is and the 129 mouse learns where the hole is and they get better and better at finding it. And likewise, the heteroplasmic animal learns also. But then, we stop for a couple of days, and then we put the animals back on the Barnes maze. And the 129 animals immediately find the hole. They remembered where it was. The NZB animals immediately found the hole. They remembered where it was. But the heteroplasmic animal has no long-term memory. It completely forgot everything it learned. So simply mixing two normal mitochondrial DNAs together in the cytoplasm completely wiped out long-term memory. And that's how important the mitochondria is to the brain. So now we can see, well, does this affect other aspects of the mitochondria? So here we're looking again at the control mouse, the 129, the NZB mouse, and the heteroplasmic mouse. But now we're looking at the mitochondria, I mean, at the gut microbiome complexity. And you can see that the mitochondrial genotype directly regulates the microbiome. Or here is a control mouse and the ND6 mutant mouse. Again, we see that the effect is controlled by the mitochondrial DNA. And uh, we had previously shown that these, this mouse makes more mitochondrial ox oxygen radicals than this one does, and this makes more oxygen radicals than this one does. So we thought if we decrease the amount of oxygen radicals with a, um, a mitochondrially targeted enzyme that gets rid of hydrogen peroxide, could we affect this gut microbiome effect? And the answer is yes, we completely reverse it. So in fact, we can directly regulate the gut microbiome by simply, simply regulating mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, meaning that the bacteria inside your cells are directly communicating with the bacteria inside your intestines. So moving back clinically, this is a proband that we studied in the, um, my goodness, what was that, the 70s. Um, this young woman was trying to get out of her wheelchair and she's rigid. She has what's called generalized dystonia. And that was before we had uh, Lee syndrome. So uh, we did an uh, MRI of her brain, uh, and you could see that she has these uh, lesions in the basal ganglia. Now, we call that basal um, uh, striatal necrosis, but now it's uh, pathognomonic of Lee syndrome. Anyway, um, this individual is this young woman up here, um, and um, uh, so she has generalized dystonia. She had a half a brother with generalized dystonia, but her mother had Labor's optic neuropathy. So if you go around the pedigree, this individual had Labor's. This uh, woman was normal, but she had two different husbands. And this individual had Labor's. These had generalized dystonia. This had both. These had dystonia. This um, pedigree, these individuals had dystonia. And they're related through this female to this female. And these individuals had Labor's. So here we have a maternal transmission of two diametrically different phenotypes. One is labors and the other is generalized dystonia. Now it turns out that those with dystonia are homoplasmic for the mitochondrial mutation, whereas those that are, have labors, the optic atrophy, are heteroplasmic. And the mutation changes this very highly conserved alanine to a valine at codon 72 in uh, the ND6 polypeptide. Now, there's another Labor's mutation that's much milder, 14484. It never gives generalized dystonia, 
but it changed this as a mildly conserved methionine to a valine at codon 64. So this is, uh, gives you labors when heteroplasmic and gives you generalized dystonia when it's homoplasmic. But this gives you uh, labors hereditary optic neuropathy only when it's homoplasmic because it's a much milder biochemical defect. So now looking at labors, this is a um, family with labors hereditary optic neuropathy, and all the affected people are related through the maternal lineage. But what you immediately see is that the more males are affected than females, and this is generally a homoplasmic mutation, but it's relatively mild. So why is it that there is this variability both in gender effects and in expressivity? And it turns out that there are now multiple labors mutations. This 3460 is the most severe, and um, if you have that mutation, this, um, then you will go blind. This is a milder mutation, 11778, and uh, this uh, will also go blind, but you're more likely to go blind if you have a certain mitochondrial DNA lineage called J. And this very mild mutation, 14484, you'll only go blind if you also have J. So these uh, milder mutations are augmented by the background mitochondrial DNA on which they occur. So the original labors, 11778, is an arginine codon 342 histidine, whereas these are different amino acid changes. So labors uh, is actually due to the loss of the optic nerve, and that results in the loss in the retina of the um, uh, retinal ganglia cells that are connected to the optic nerve. And the optic nerve in this portion of the eye, which is uh, the, the optic nerve crosses over the front of the eye where the light has to go through to get to the photoreceptors at the back of the eye. So this has to be clear and it can't have this lipid myelin or it would diffract the light. So it takes a lot more energy to maintain the membrane potential in this part of the optic nerve than it does here. And we believe that's why these are, this part of the optic nerve is so sensitive to mild mitochondrial defects. So getting back to this J, what is J and why would it make the 11778 or the 314484 mutation more um, uh, severe. Well, what we did is we um, used the idea that the mitochondrial DNA being exclusively maternally inherited, that the number of nucleotide differences between any two people would be directly proportional to the time they shared a common mother. So by sequencing the mitochondrial DNA from indigenous people around the world, we reasoned that we could reconstruct the maternal migration of people and figure out where people came from. And the oldest mitochondrial DNAs are Sub-Saharan Africans, and we call those L0. L1 and L2 are pygmy types. L3 are Sub-Saharan Africans. And in Ethiopia, only two mitochondrial DNAs arose, M and N, and they're the only mitochondrial DNAs that left Africa and colonized all the rest of the world and moved into the temperate zone to give rise to European lineages, H-J-T-U-U-K-V, I-W-X, and it also moved laterally in the temperate zone to give uh, lineages uh, in the um, Asian subcontinent. But M stayed in the tropics all the way down to Australia, and only much later moved into the temperate zone to give these lineages. And then about 40,000 years ago, A from N and C and D from M, became enriched in Chukotka, and they are available to cross the Bering Land Bridge 20,000 years ago and form the first Native Americans. So it turns out that mitochondrial DNA lineages are highly geographically constrained. And why would that be? Because here in Africa, if you want to, a woman and you want to survive and reproduce, you need to be able to run away from lions. And that means you need to have a very efficient mitochondria. And it's also hot, so you don't want to make a lot of heat. So you have tightly coupled mitochondria that maximize the main ATP for calorie burned. But up here, the lions froze to death. What the problem is, is that people froze to death. So how is that different? Well, mutations occurred in the mitochondrial DNA that decreased their efficiency. And by decreasing their efficiency, you had to eat more calories for the same amount of ATP, but that generated more heat, and that was important for surviving in the cold. But now you had to eat a high-fat diet to maintain all of that uh, calorie burning, and that's why then these people have to hunt marine animals, mammals. So out of Africa then, this lineage stayed in the tropics, and these are only non functional mutations, called so-called synonymous mutations. But those that went into the temperate zone, they had these two missense mutations, and they changed the coupling efficiency and allowed our ancestors to live in the cold by becoming less efficient. 
In fact, every time we have a new branch of the mitochondrial DNA tree, and this is just a part of the European tree, it's always founded by a change and a critically important um, amino acid. So this lineage J that um, increases labor's penetrance has two cytochrome B mutations, 14798, and that mutation changes an amino acid that's conserved throughout all multicellular animals. And this 15257 changes a cytochrome B mutation that's conserved all the way to E. coli. Yet 10% of the people in Europe have these polymorphisms. So these are adaptive polymorphisms that are in fact less good than the original polymorphisms that founded the uh, population. So it turns out that these adaptive polymorphisms with their varying energy efficiency also predispose to a wide variety of common diseases. And this is just looking at autism spectrum disorder and I, J, K, T, U, and X all have about a, a two-fold higher uh, risk of autism uh, than uh, the most common mitochondrial DNA, what we call R0. And males are four times more likely to get autism than females. And so, in fact, the mitochondrial haplogroups have the almost half as big effect as gender. And that's interesting because these represent 55% of all the European mitochondrial DNAs. So this is a huge genetic factor in predisposition to autism. We can do the same for diabetes and metabolic syndrome. So these are mitochondrial lineages that are associated with diabetes. And this lineage, N5A, N9A, it's protective. When you have less than one, that's protective, as opposed to higher than one, that increases your risk. So this is protective of diabetes. This line these lineages are increased risk for hypertension and increased risk for obesity. So why is that really interesting? Well, this is a pedigree with that original 3243 mutation that I said at 10 to 30% in Europeans gives diabetes. But these people had diabetes, but 88% of their mitochondrial DNAs were mutant. So why didn't they have Milos syndrome? And the answer was because they had the N9A uh, variant background and that compensated for the higher 3243 mutation. And thus they had the milder phenotype. This is just a mutation in the tRNA um, glutamine gene that increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And if you have uh, Alzheimer's disease and you look at the mitochondrial DNA somatic mutation, right, the mutation of the brain cells, and here we're just looking at a portion of the mitochondrial DNA, then Alzheimer's brains have this particular deleterious mutation. 65% of the Alzheimer's brains have this mutation. If you look at Down syndrome with dementia, about 60% have that mutation, but age match controls never have this control regulatory mutation. And if we look at different regulatory regions of the brain, we can see controls have very few of these mutations in the brain. Down syndrome has slightly more, Down syndrome with dementia higher, and Alzheimer's have even more. So this, this Alzheimer's, which is a late onset disease, is being turned on by the late lifelong accumulation of the secondary damage that then ultimately causes energetic failure. So now we can look at the uh, mitochondrial DNA copy number. And as we age, our mitochondrial DNA copy number in our brain declines. Um, if you have Down syndrome, initially you have a high copy number to compensate for the energetic defect. But then uh, when you get dementia, it drops below the line and all Alzheimer's patients are below the line. So again, here are two different diseases that have a mitochondrial energetic component. And so we can actually ask, is the, are these somatic mutations really involved in aging? So we made a mouse in which we put a catalase enzyme into the mitochondria and catalase take, took away all that hydrogen peroxide that was making hydroxyl radicals. And when we made a mouse with this a transgene, it lived 20% longer and it has 50% less a mitochondrial DNA damage. So we're using this idea that maybe we can develop drugs to decrease mitochondrial oxygen stress and therefore mitigate some of the age-related diseases. So this is just a pedigree where we have a mutation in the nuclear encoded adenine nucleotide translocator, a heart muscle isoform. And this arose about 500 years ago in this uh, Mennonite um, population. And because they tend to marry each other, uh, the nuclear recessive gene in two individuals that are heterozygous, one-fourth of their children can get a homozygous mutant, and that gives you cardiomyopathy. 
But what was amazing about this pedigree is that these people in red had a, a fulminating di lethal dilated cardiomyopathy, whereas these people in blue had late onset hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and lived perfectly normal lives. So why is the same mutation, this uh, frame shift mutation in ANT1, why is it so different in phenotype? And the answer was those with the mild mitochond mitochondrial defect uh, had mitochondrial DNA haplogroup H, whereas those with the severe heart defect had mitochondrial DNA haplogroup U. So the nuclear mutations phenotype was regulated by the not mitochondrial DNA background. So we made a mouse where we knocked out the adenine nucleotide translocator, and it has cardiac dysrhythmia shown by this very erratic heartbeat. And it accumulates these somatic mutations uh, over time because of the energetic defect. So what we can do then is we can take the ANT mouse and then combine it with the CO1 mutation or the ND6 mutation to give you these nuclear plus mitochondrial DNA combinations. And when we do that, this is the heart size of the normal mouse. This is the CO1 mutant mouse, ND6 mutant mouse, ANT mouse, ANT CO1, and ANT ND6. And the ANT ND6 mouse has a 50% reduction in lifespan and premature aging, and thus it exactly proves that we have an interaction then between the nucleus and the cytoplasm to create the most severe phenotypes. So finally, why are there some people, males, that are more resistant to mitochondrial disease than females? And we were very interested in that a number of years ago, and we thought, well, maybe it's hormonal. So we looked at the estrogen receptor, which binds uh, estradiol, um, uh, estrogen hormone. And there are two estrogen receptors, one called alpha and one called beta. What we found is estrogen receptor beta was primarily in the mitochondria, about 20%. And that was a really surprised because people had thought all the estrogen receptors would be in the cytoplasm. Moreover, when we add estradiol, to mitochondria or cells, we can double the antioxidant defenses of the mitochondria within an hour. So this estradiol binding receptor somehow regulates the mitochondrial manganese superoxide dismutase and thus protects the cells against oxidative stress. So the reason that we believe women are more resistant than men to some of these mitochondrial diseases is because they have a built-in hormonal structure for decreasing the mitochondrial oxidative damage, and that, in fact, protects them uh, for the accumulated damage. Uh, now, an interesting uh, aspect of that is that there are some classic uh, Chinese um, herbal drugs, phyto phytoceuticals, uh, that bind to estrogen receptor beta. And, um, Scientists at, in Bologna in Italy took these, uh, these compounds and fed them to labor's uh, cells, and the complex uh, mitochondrial uh, growth, the growth of the cells in galactose, which is an inhibitor of mitochondrial function, um, the wild-type uh, cells grow fine when galactose, but the, the labor's mutants grow slowly. But if they add these drugs, they can completely normalize the growth rate of the, um, of the labor's cells. And that also involves the oxygen consumption. So basically then by upregulating uh, the antioxidant defenses in the mitochondria with these um, phytoestrogens that bind estrogen beta, we can offset the uh, mild biochemical effect of, of the labor's mutation. And now there's a growing interest in a whole series of drugs that are affecting mitochondrial function, CoQ analogs, uh, MitoQ, um, uh, Epi743, which is no longer called that, idibinone, and then an inhibitor of the mitochondrial permeability transition pore, cytoclosin, cyclosporin A. So I think we're beginning to now, with this biochemical understanding, develop a therapeutic interventions that may, in fact, alleviate some of the symptoms that we experience. So I'd like to end by saying that um, we've, we've become very interested in uh, the classic therapeutic systems that have been developed in um, uh, indigenous populations over thousands of years by trial and error. And um, that certainly has been formulated most by the classic Chinese traditional medicine. And this is their symbol for life, or qi. So um, I argue that their, their therapeutics have primarily been targeted about energy, 
whereas Western medicine's therapeutics have been primarily targeted about anatomy. And it's the anatomy and the energy are brought together by the mitochondria. So I think that many of the interesting observations that can be made by phyto, about the beneficial effects of phytochemicals or acupuncture or Tai Chi or meditation, that they are in fact the bringing together of these two ideas to, form, to finish the formula of life, which is both anatomy, energy, and information. And I'd like to finish by mentioning all the great people that did the work. Um, uh, Megan uh, and uh, Martin were very important in a lot of the mouse work. Um, Tal did all the microbiome work, and uh, uh, Larry and uh, Demetra did all the population genetics work, and these are all the great people that make the lab work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wallace. I mean, this is, it, it's um, so incredibly encouraging to know that, you know, out, just outside of mitochondrial disease and all the different major diseases that are being impacted by the mitochondrial, it provides such a level of hope um, for this community that this disease will start to receive more attention. And so we just appreciate all that you do and your commitment to this community and for sharing all of this wonderful information. Well, so you, you, all are, you all are the pioneers. So it's always hard to be the pioneer, but you're always the people that make the big changes. So don't lose faith. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. So now we're going to open it up for questions. Just a reminder, if you're on your computer, you can submit your questions directly through the Q&A screen on the bottom menu. And if you are on your phone, you can email them to info at mitoaction.org. And I am now going to turn it over to Stephanie, who will facilitate the Q&A. Hi, this is Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Wallace, for taking the time to share your vast knowledge uh, and answer our community's questions about mitochondrial disease. This community is forever indebted to you for your discoveries and your unwavering commitment to mitochondrial medicine and the families whose lives are affected by mitochondrial disease. As a reminder, Today's Fine. presentation will be posted on our website for anyone who would like to listen again, share with others, or go back at a later date and listen. We thank each and every one of you for joining us for today's monthly MITO Expert Series, and you will be able to find this presentation as well as other presentations at the mitoaction.org website. So I'd like to open it up with our first question. Um, and this was sent in from one of our listeners. And it's, uh, they said some chronic fatigue patients benefit from IV injections of B12, even when they are not deficient. Can this be explained from a mitochondrial point of view? Um, <clears throat> excellent question. Um, uh, it, it could be explained. That doesn't mean that we know it is explained. So that's, um, that's the difference between inference and um, having uh, available facts. Um, but if we argue that chronic fatigue syndrome is due to a mild mitochondrial defect and that some individuals that mild mitochondrial defect have changes in mitochondrial enzymes that also use B12 uh, as a cofactor, um, or in fact B6 is another one, um, then in fact you might in fact get some benefit from that uh, treatment. Um, but I'm saying that that's a possibility. I'm not saying that I know that for a fact. That is a, a good answer as far as the inference with the chronic fatigue and the correlation to mitochondrial disease. Um, another question we have, uh, Dr. Wallace, is earlier in your presentation, you mentioned some things about migraines. We have a patient who's new to LHON, and they had suffered from migraines long before their diagnosis of the mutation 11778. And could that mutation be the cause of some of their migraines? Um, it is entirely possible that that's true. Um, obviously, I, I can't diagnose that patient on that particular phenotype um, um, uh, electronically, um, but certainly uh, mitochondrial defects in some individuals do in fact uh, create chronic migraine. Um, labors is not commonly associated with chronic migraine, but uh, also, there's a great deal of variability between people, um, even with the same 11778 mutation, 
again, as I pointed out, be, depending on the mitochondrial DNA background or even nuclear gene, gene changes that they have also inherited. So um, it is, uh, it seems to me quite possible that it's contributory, but probably not the only reason why um, this individual might have migraines. Okay, um, I hope that answers their question. We have another question regarding the um, always discussed uh, mito cocktail within our group of individuals. Do you see changes of coming into the mito cocktail and the components of it as your, your research dives takes a deeper dive into how things can, with the Chinese medicine, can incorporate different aspects and, and making some changes? This cocktail has been around for about 20 years and it's been pretty static, but I feel like maybe there's an opportunity to make changes to it. Um, uh, that That is, in fact, entirely uh, where we at, uh, in my laboratory and my colleagues at CHOP um, are uh, pushing as hard as we can. We've, we've now, uh, understand when I started this in 1971, um, we didn't even uh, know there wasn't such a thing as a mitochondrial disease. Um, we now have um, uh, some real molecular data that show that there's mitochondrial disease and we can actually make pretty good molecular diagnoses. What we don't have is something that's really powerfully effective to, to help our community. So the reason I spent 25 years making these mouse models, um, which then recapitulate all the, the characteristics of human disease, is we're now using these mouse models to screen drugs. And the, uh, the idea is we've never had a good preclinical model. That is a model that we could test a drug on before we had to go into a clinical trial. So um, I think that we are now in a position to begin to really look at things, um, not only mitococktail, which is, of course, uh, what people have been using for a long time, but some of these newer ideas of drugs, such as using some of the traditional Chinese uh, phytoceuticals. So um, we're very keen on, um, on developing these kinds of studies. Um, I wish they would go a lot faster, but I'm, uh, I'm hopeful now that with the preclinical models and with our understanding of the biochemistry and the molecular biology of the disease, that we will in the not too distant future begin to develop and have some real armamentarium to, to help alleviate some of these problems. Unfortunately, uh, that's in the future right now, we're still um, just struggling to get the money to um, make these kinds of studies possible. Definitely, that's uh, the struggle is always there for the research. And I'm glad that you're seeing the parallels to some of the other life limiting diseases out there. So hopefully we can start uh, leveraging some of the research and funding. We have another question for you uh, regarding LHON. It is, why is that mostly all mitochondrial diseases show heterogeneous phenotype but there are a few like LHON, which show the tissue specific phenotype. Yes, that is probably one of the most interesting questions in the field. Um, and I would be wrong to tell this questioner that we actually know uh, in, in full the answer, um, but we do have some insights over the last um, 30 years. First of all, uh, labors is um, often due to uh, mutation in the mitochondrial DNA that is present in most of the mitochondrial DNAs in the cell, what we would call homoplasmic. So therefore, the biochemical defect of labors, of the labors mutation is pretty constant across the body because it doesn't have this heteroplasmy causing variable percentages of mutant in different organs. So I would contrast that with say the MELAS mutation at 3243, where some individuals get chronic head, headaches, migraines, uh, some people um, get seizures, some people have muscle and, and heart disease. Um, there we have a heteroplasmy with a great deal of random uh, variation in the genotype across the body. Um, so that, that certainly is one reason why some mitochondrial diseases are so variable and others are not. But still, um, the, the unique features of labors of this uh, delayed onset and sudden onset loss of vision um, is quite, um, quite stunning. And uh, it was, in fact, um, the reason that it was like that that caused me to first look at labors for a mitochondrial DNA mutation. 
because I thought that at least there we had a consistent phenotype and that we might be able to find a consistent genetic inheritance. But why the optic nerve is specifically sensitive in this particular mutation, we don't entirely know. I did try to mention that um, the optic nerve fibers go across the front of the eye, so they have to be transparent. That makes them more energy demanding and therefore more sensitive to energetic defect. Um, and we do see optic atrophy in some other mitochondrial disease cases, but it's much more sporadic. So um, that isn't a complete answer, but it's certainly one we're, we're very interested in pursuing. And I wish I knew more about it. Um, just as a side note here, um, or another question, I mean, what are your thoughts on gene therapy for changing out the defective genes versus trying to find a medicine that could either bypass or possibly help a gene's function? Yes. Um, so our, our center... Um, uh, is heavily invested in both um, gene therapy, uh, developing gene therapy for mitochondrial diseases, and also in uh, pharmacological and nutraceutical approaches. Um, on the gene therapy approach, um, uh, if the mutation that causes the mitochondrial disease is due to a mutation in the nuclear genes, remember there's one to 2,000 of those, then, there, uh, then one could imagine a classic gene therapy approach using, say, an adeno-associated virus to deliver the uh, normal gene to the affected cells and perhaps have a beneficial effect. And uh, one of the areas that we've been working very hard on is to develop a gene therapy uh, for the adenine nucleotide translocator heart disease, because uh, if we could um, mitigate the a a adenine nucleotide translocator defect, we might be able to stave off this dilated cardiomyopathy that kills the children. Um, so that there is a, definitely a gene therapy approach, but it's going to be easiest in the nuclear genes. Now, the mitochondrial DNA is a, an especially difficult problem because there are a thousand mitochondrial DNAs in each cell. So how could we introduce um, the better gene into every mitochondria to give you uh, the, the boost that you would need to get your, your health back? Um, so we're, we're also working on different approaches to solve that problem. Um, none of them do I believe are even close to being uh, useful. Um, but uh, it is certainly a possibility. In the interim, uh, what um, we are all doing is looking for uh, a chemical bullet to uh, help mitigate some of the biochemical or metabolic defects. And so um, our lab and many others have developed uh, systems for screening cells or small animals like C. elegans or Drosophila or fish to look for drugs that will mitigate mitochondrial disease. And I think that those are going to be the first line therapies that will be helpful of patients before gene therapy, but both are going to be important. All right, um, we have another question uh, regarding the POLG mouse. Have you created a POLG mouse model? And if so, what have you learned from this? Also due to replication and depletion in POLG, do you believe that Eastern medicine slash QI could also be applicable to this mutation regardless of phenotype? Um, we don't have a mouse uh, with that particular um, uh, gene defect. Um, it, um, I, I'd like people to understand it took 20 years to make the mice that I showed you. So, um, and those are several millions of dollars investment. So the problem is it's, uh, we just don't have the resources to, to make a good model for all the important diseases. Um, there are, um, however, um, uh, less expensive models. Uh, one is a small fish called a zebrafish. Um, it, uh, it's a lot cheaper to make uh, mutations in zebrafish. The problem is that, of course, we don't know that their, their physiology is going to be the same as is going to be useful for a person. Um, so um, uh, people like my good colleague, um, 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 Arnie Falk, is, has, is creating multiple uh, zebrafish uh, mutants for a larger number of different uh, mitochondrial diseases, although I don't think she has that one. Um, so it's, it's possible that over time we will get animal models for a large number of the mitochondrial diseases, but this is 
uh, you know, th these other model systems are pretty recent, so they're just beginning to get tooled up and to really find out how powerful they are. So unfortunately, I, I wish we could have a model for every disease so we could be working on them in parallel, but uh, it, you know, given the small budget we have, it's just not possible, and I'm sorry. No, that's, that's understandable. Um, we also have one more question. Can you touch on why mitochondria make their own fatty acids and the impact of defects in that particular pathway? Oh, yes. Um, so if, uh, if you're still seeing my screen, um, there's a slightly blurry picture of a lady with glasses. Um, and that is a Deborah Murdoch. And Deborah Murdoch is the world authority on mitochondrial fatty acid biosynthesis. And she is uh, actively building mouse models of the uh, diseases of that particular pathway and um, uh, uh, actively thinking about developing therapeutics. What we don't know actually is really what the fatty acid biosynthesis pathway of the mitochondria does. It makes one compound called lipoic acid and lipoic acid is important for certain enzymes that are involved in the mitochondrial metabolism. But um, that, that doesn't explain uh, the clinical presentation of the people with like MECR mutation as, as a common example. Um, so uh, Dr. Um, Murdoch is uh, actively looking at what these fatty acids are doing in managing the structure of the um, uh, mitochondrial enzymology. Uh, she thinks that these may be important molecules in sending signals um, and in communicating between mitochondria. So that's a very, very exciting and active area, but truly there are only two or three people in the world that, that um, are even funded to work in that area, and that's, she's cer certainly one of them. So um, we're, she, in fact, just yesterday we were talking about our, uh, the mouse colony we are ha developing for the fatty acid uh, biosynthesis mutations. So hopefully we will have some preclinical models for those diseases soon. All right, uh, we have two more questions uh, from uh, Adam. He says, thank you, Dr. Wallace, for all of your hard work and providing this information. I have a lot of learning to do. I'm curious about how I can support your efforts and help move the research forward, keeping in mind that I am just a patient with mitochondrial disease who has a lot to learn about what you presented today. Thanks again. So well, how can you support uh, your research and help keep things at the forefront? Well, first of all, um, I'd like to point out that we all have a lot to learn. Um, and each of us is sort of uh, at a different stage in this learning curve. But uh, under, remember from uh, when I started in 1971, I started with a simple idea. Um, I, I came out of the military and um, wanted to go to graduate school. Um, I, I wanted to study something interesting and I had had a physics background in, in college. Um, and it occurred to me that everybody was talking about anatomy in medicine and that um, the, the most important thing would be what animated people. So I decided to start studying energy and uh, everybody thought that was the craziest thing anybody could ever imagine. Everybody knew there couldn't be a disease of energy. Um, so here we are, you know, 40 years later, we, we do know something. But what we don't know is, uh, you know, how to cure the patients. That's, the, that's what we need to know. Um, so uh, my, my state to you is, um, first of all, don't lose faith, keep the faith, do learn, but also um, if, if you have the opportunity to talk to anyone that might be important in the political process uh, and indicate that this is not a rare disease that affects a few people that are not important. These are all important people that have a disease that might give us the answer to all the common diseases and that we need to help um, educate the medical community and the political community that this is a very important area to, that needs support. And uh, that's the best thing I think you can do, keeping the faith, uh, never giving up, and um, advocating. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. That was really well said. Um, I'm the mother of a, of a child who has a mitochondrial disease, and after 20 years, we're still trying very hard to stay keeping the faith. So yep. again, I really thank you for your time today and for giving out such great information and we're definitely keeping our, our fire of hope alive. 
Um, we want to thank everybody today for joining us on our monthly MITO expert series. And again, you can uh, be able to find and re-listen to Dr. Wallace's presentation in the next coming days at mitoaction.org. We'd like to have everybody please be safe. And if there's anything MITO Action can do to support you or your families, please reach out to us. That's why we're here. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward to having you join us again next time. Thank you, everyone. And Thank don't, you. Lose, don't lose the faith. We will Thank not you, Dr. Faith. Wallace. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.